All right, our next speaker is Dr. Paul Price. He is the plant pathologist here in the Northeast region. I don't know you're in research and extension or all of the Most above. Extension, a little bit of research. Just, if you got a disease, call Trace. He does gardens too, if you really want. So you don't have to put that on. We find uh, your presentation. We're getting you pulled up here. Not that's not it. Yeah. That's crop, crop. Well, I hate to tell y'all, I don't have any neat videos like Drew did. Um, so that's going to be disappointing for you. I got to meet him at the Row Rice meeting. I guess that's it was it last right week. There. And he does a really nice job on his presentations. It's a tough act to follow for sure. There it is. We always mess up with you, Trey. I know. That's fine. That's okay. I'm, I got I'm you I'm used now. to being a guinea pig. I got you now. <laughs> All right. Hang on just a second. All right. Always our guinea pig. <laughs> All right. You're good to go. Okay, Dennis asked me to do a talk, and he, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? He said, fungicide, yes or no? And I wouldn't be doing my job if I just came in here and gave you a yes or a no. There's a, uh, a few more details involved in that. So uh, my answer right now would be it depends. Um, Northern, every year, Northern Corn Leaf Blight is an issue in the northeast part of the state. Um, that's our number one foliar disease problem. There are the symptoms there. You can you can pick it up early. Uh, I picked it up as early as V6 and susceptible hybrids. And uh, if we get if if you got a susceptible hybrid with wet weather during June, regular rainfall events, uh, you're in you're in for some trouble if you don't apply a fungicide. Uh, we plant a lot of susceptible hybrids in the northeast part of the state. I, I I looked for the data as far as the breakout of the acres and I couldn't find it, but. This is a variety of value or hybrid evaluation here at the Macon Ridge Station last year. We had incredible northern corn leaf blight pressure. I've ranked the, uh, the hybrids there as far as susceptibility goes. They're highlighted and uh, you can see you might recognize some of these hybrids uh, that you may have had on your farm or that you dealt with this past year um, where you had to apply a fungicide to, to manage northern corn leaf blight. With resistant hybrids, it's not uncommon to see lesions up to you know four percent and on a lot of the uh, resistant hybrids the northern corn leaf blight lesions will look different they're a little bit difficult to identify particularly the pioneer 13 16 i think that's the right number will have a really strange lesion on it but it's got resistance so um, uh, identification is key but these susceptible hybrids can get really nasty in a given season if we have the right weather most fungicides work on northern corn leaf blight that's a good thing so this is a trial we had last year i put this in here because there are some newer products here that i wanted you to be aware of the beltima and revitec and mirabus neo and the lucento all of those have sdhi materials in them and triazole materials in them newer generation triazoles uh, another thing you need to be aware of that fmc is going to be marketing this year we had a trial with fmc last year using an infera fungicide called Zyway. It's the same active ingredient as TopGuard. So we applied these fungicides in fura and disease started early in the season. So we got control of northern corn leaf blight with an infera application of a fungicide. And it's my understanding that this, this material can be adapted to any of your uh, starter fertilizer rigs and a number of, of things that deliver materials in fura. I'm going to look at this again this year. I've seen enough uh, data from my colleagues from other states. We had a meeting up in St. Louis with pretty much every pathologist that I'm, that I'm aware of that works in corn, and they've looked at this material, and their data looks similar. All of these treatments right here that receives Iowa Infer were, uh, had a significant reduction in northern corn leaf blight, and they were the best treatments in the trial. The reason they were the best treatments in the trial is because disease started early in this field. This is a infer application here along with an application at tassel and it was our highest yield um, the reason a lot of these uh, applications here at this other application at tassel probably didn't work is because we had disease start early and it was a little late on the timing overall our yields were uh, you know we didn't see huge differences but again we had a dry spell in july and that kind of slowed that disease development down and it didn't really get awful like that picture i uh, showed earlier this is awful. So this is how bad it can get in a, in a bad year as far as northern corn leaf blight goes. That's a treated plot on the left, non-treated on the right. Uh, 
So if you guys susceptible hybrid, the answer on, to fungicide is yes. The other problem we have to worry about every year is southern rust. And we don't have to worry about it as much as our neighbors to the north in most years. Most years, southern rust comes along late enough to where our crop's going to outrun that problem. Um, identification of this is key. It can be confused with common rust. The way to differentiate between common rust and southern rust is flip the leaf over. Those pustules for southern rust more than likely will not be on the underside of those leaves. Need help identifying it? That's why I'm here. That's my job. Send me a sample and it's, it's very easy to, to identify in the laboratory or just by looking at it. I can usually identify it just by looking at a picture on a cell phone. Most fungicides are effective on southern rust. A lot of options there. So that's a good thing for us. As far as making an application decision for southern rust, there's no sense in inventing the wheel. Clayton Olier came up with this in 2017. It's kind of a guide to whether or not you need to make an application for southern rust. And essentially, if you've got temperatures between 77 and 90 degrees, and we've got a long leaf wetness period, which is not uncommon in Louisiana, everybody knows that. Yeah. Those minutes, Dre, just got a, something tight in. For some reason, his slides are not advancing uh, on the outline site. Hmm. Uh oh. Well, they're advancing on ours, so. Is there a lag? Is it? A, can you tell on your end, Mr. L? Is it just one or several? What's the chat saying? I gotta close out. You gotta get out of here. Ain't technology grand. <laughs> you can go right there. Working oh, for Matt. Okay. Working for Matt. Don says okay now. Okay. All right. All right. Hang on just a minute. I gotta we'll get, get you back. <laughs> I don't know. You just, you know, you just get the guinea pig and. Right. Oh, that's quite all right. Quite all right. Things happen. Now. I'll get us back. Okay, so uh, Dr. Ole came up with this How's guide. What is he doing now? I don't have him back here though. Okay, hang on. Now. Now try. Working now? Right here. Okay. All right. So, Advanced five. okay, the, the conditions you're going to, that, that are favorable for an explosive southern rust event, especially if you have southern rust start early around tasseling. If you pick up southern rust around tasseling, 100% of the time, I'm going to recommend you treat the field. We've got temperatures between 77 and 90 degrees, which is common. Leaf wetness, 9 to 16 hours, which is common. And frequent light rain and light wind events. Those are the optimal conditions for southern rust development. And that's going to move all those spores around. It's going to, it's going to really spread that epidemic quickly. Uh, interestingly enough, with heavy rain, you know, you get a big heavy rain, a front come through or something like that. It really lowers the risk for southern rust to develop because it washes all the spores out of the air. But uh, also, he puts a note here, uh, if the growth stage is, is uh, less than R5, essentially. So... I've done some work with southern rust as far as uh, when, when we have southern rust come in late at R5 and we put out applications here. This is a trial at Dean Lee several years ago. We had a we had southern rust in the field. It was at R5 stage, which is dent. I uh, had a non-treated check, uh, put a approach Prima and Preaxer out there. Uh, we, you know, we saw a little bit of effect on the southern rust, but the main the main thing here is we saw no effect on our yields. Those yields aren't anything to write home about, but that's dry land corn in central Louisiana. So that's that's going to be a, the case a lot of times. Um, we didn't observe any lodging in this trial, and we were delayed harvest. And it, I think Matt Foster alluded to it earlier. I, lodging is, is really driven by hybrids. I, there are certain hybrids that are going to be really susceptible to lodging. So we came out all right on that trial. So some things to consider uh, if you're if you're considering making a fungicide application on a given field is how well corn can tolerate defoliation. And this is old. This is an old information, 1984, but it's pretty much all we have. 
Dr. Ole, Dr. Fromm, and myself, we put in field trials for two seasons, and we were doing manual defoliation at certain stages, and our data pretty much came out as the same as this. So we're just going to keep using this. Um, and I kind of zoomed in on it here, but the take home here, 10% defoliation and tassel, you're looking at a 3% yield loss. But you have to keep in mind what, what stage you are because the further you get out from tasseling, the more damage you can take on that corn crop. So it depends on what your disease severity is at a given time whenever you, you decide to make an application. We've got another tool that we've developed across state lines uh, based on our, our fungicide data here and, and, and elsewhere in the state. And I make a special version of this for Louisiana. I just put the diseases on here that are relevant to Louisiana. And this is a fungicide efficacy table. It's got all the fungicides we have that are uh, available in corn production. It has how well they work on certain diseases. So if you look here, we've got northern corn leaf blight. That's quilt Excel, multiple generics. That's probably one of the more cheaper products you can get. It's rated as a very good. Well, we've got a lot of other products on here that are rated as very good that uh, wouldn't be classified as cheaper in my book. So that's a place where you can save an input cost in your operations. Other, other things that we may come across in a given season where you may consider putting a fungicide out is gray leaf spot. I've seen that a handful of times in the state. It's a, kind of a rarity down here. It's more of an issue up north, but I'll put a maybe on this one. You might have to treat for that depending on the hybrid, depending on the time of the year. Um, Southern corn leaf blight, I've seen this recently, and I know of fields that have been treated for it. Some, some hybrids that, uh, for, for whatever reason, they, they have some susceptibility to southern corn leaf blight, and there have been a few fields treated in the state. So as far as fungicide application there, I'm going to put a maybe, but probably unlikely you're going to have that issue in the field. Big two are northern corn leaf blight and southern rust. Common rust is no. If you find that, if, it, if you know it's common rust, don't spray for it. I never recommend anybody spray for it because as soon as the weather gets hot, that becomes a non-issue. Curbularia leaf spot. Uh, we don't know yet. We don't know if that one causes yield loss or not. I saw one field last year where I kind of scratched my head. I said, well, maybe this field's bad enough where we're seeing yield loss. But I found a hybrid that gets curbularia leaf spot but does not get any of these other ones. I'm going to plant it this year and do a yield loss trial and see if we can figure that out. Most fungicides are effective on curbularia leaf spot. But whether or not we're making a difference in yield, we don't know yet. Probably not. My gut tells me it's a cos cosmetic issue, but we need the data to back that up. I was fortunate enough to be part of a project where we did a meta-analysis over um, treatments across a, a lot of studies there. It's almost 500 some odd treatments. And the take home from that study was 68% of the time in the presence of disease with a susceptible hybrid you'll see a positive uh, return or a positive yield response from a fungicide application. So those are your odds based on that data we use in that study. You have a better, better chance with uh, mixed modes of action and the tassel and timing were, were best. And that's just data from this slide. The top two uh, from that study, the top two are V6 timing. You have QOI only, and these are the, that's the probability of recovering the cost of the fungicide. So you have a 30% probability here. If you use the mixed mode of action, you got a 50% probability. And that probability decreases with the cost of the application. That makes a lot of sense, right? But the best time in here at VT on the bottom graphs, we got the QOI only, you've got a 65%. If you've got that mixed mode of action, which is usually a DMI, QOI, maybe an SDHI too, you've got a 75% of recovering the cost of the application. Uh, Dr. Padgett, when I started in his program, we were doing a lot of, of research as far as looking at the uh, response of corn to fungicide applications in the absence of disease. We didn't see any any significant variation from zero there. If there, if, if there was something there, we would have picked it up in, the, in, the, in this analysis. But uh, we also did a lot of harvesting stalks and determining stalk densities and we didn't see any difference between non-treated plots and, and treated plots as far as stalk density goes. And this was done over multiple locations in the Mid-South and uh, over many years, actually. A lot of work went into it. 
I don't recommend applying fungicides to corn in the absence of disease. And one of the reasons why is the data I just I just discussed that Dr. Paget worked on years ago, and the other is fungicide resistance. It's only a matter of time before we're going to have fungicide resistance in some of these pathogen populations. I'm working with Kirsten Wise out of the University of Kentucky. She's got a graduate student looking at this very thing, and I sent uh, several isolates uh, from the all over the northeast part of the, the state of, uh, of the northern corn leaf blight pathogen. So we're waiting to see what that student comes up with. I hope they don't find resistance here. But it's something you need to keep in mind that we need to we need to hang on to the tools that we have for as long as we can. Uh, that way we can use them. And that way they'll work longer and be useful for us in our programs. Uh, with that, I want to thank the Louisiana Soybean and Grain Promotion Board for their funding and, and everybody that I collaborate with. We collaborate with a lot of folks. We try to make the best out of that, that funding and uh, really have the producers' bottom lines in, in mind whenever we're doing that research. And those were my